So the Gospel of John chapter 4, reading from the New King James Translation. Uh, last time we were studying the interactions of Jesus with a woman at the well in Sychar of Samaria. It was a culture that was quite unusual for a Jewish man to be talking with a Samaritan at all, much less a, a, a Samaritan woman. Um, but there they were. His simple request for a drink of water turned into a revelation to the woman that Jesus was the promised Messiah and, and would teach her fellow Samaritan all things. Um, or at least all things they were curious about that they could have the time for. So we finished in verse 26. Uh, if you want to pick up all the teachings from John, you can go to the Facebook group or soon I'll, I'll try to post it to YouTube um, from the first verse of, of the Gospel of John. But uh, at this point, we finished verse 26, when Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah to her. And uh, right away, we're reminded that God can lead us into uh, what we think are the most unusual situations to reach people that are most unlikely to bring him honor and glory and, and salvation to, to many other people. So today we'll start in verse 27, as we see the work of God is not over yet, but just the beginning there in Sychar. Gospel of John, chapter 4 verse 27 through verse 42. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to, him, to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. Do you not say, There are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps and receives, receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you've entered into their labors. And because of the Samaritans of that, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that I ever did. So that when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two more days. And many more believed because of his, because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ the Savior of the world. Wow, what a great account of how in, in just a few days many people came to the Lord through an unlikely witness. <laughs> you ever feel like an unlikely witness for the Lord? <laughs> I know I do. But let's start at the beginning of verse 27. Re remember earlier in the chapter, Jesus had been, taught, walk, had been walking with the group on the trip. It was almost noon, and in verse 6 it said he was worn out from the trip and he sat down by this well. Well, we, we catch the glimpse of his humanity. Yes, he was God, 100% God, and yes, he was 100% man. Uh, but we don't see that very often, that weariness very often. So we, we catch that, he's resting, but his disciples went ahead, pushed into the city, said, ah, we gotta take care of our master. We'll go in, get some food. And they probably left him maybe an hour or so earlier uh, and when he was tired and alone. But, but now he's there with some woman, okay? Uh, because of the type of clothes she is wearing in that culture, they probably figured out this woman didn't have the best reputation. In verse 27, at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman was probably just standing there with her mouth hanging open at this point in time because she was probably shocked at what she had just experienced. I mean, she, it was so unbelievable and she knew it was true. She, the Messiah had just been revealed. She had questions running through her mind, I can imagine, and she didn't know even, even know which one to ask first. Okay? And Jesus was standing there quietly. I can just see him after he reveals himself and says, you know, you, you, when she asked about the Messiah, he's like, that's me. Basically, he was saying, that's me. And all of a sudden, they realize 
this group of men, probably noisy, were coming from the city, they have their, uh, you know, they got food, uh, they're probably chattering away, you know, their, their bags from Walmart were, were shaking and making noise, well, maybe not the bags from Walmart, but suddenly they realized, you know, from that, that noise that was coming, all of a sudden there's silence, because these guys are like, what's going on here? They don't know what's happening with Jesus. And they weren't gonna say anything, they stopped moving, and they had a lot of questions too. So one of the things that I find interesting is that no one dared say at that point, why, did, why are you doing this? And I think they'd known Jesus long enough to know that he's gonna do some things and we shouldn't question them, okay? Even if they're unusual, you know? We've been through the temple, you know? <laughs> we've been through the baptisms, um, we've been, been through several things. And so while he didn't always follow the customs and traditions, of the religious people of that day, he had the right reasons for not doing so. And everything that he would do would be appropriate and above board. So as they waited to see what was gonna happen next, I think the woman probably is just a bit embarrassed, but realized that she can't keep this to herself. And so she takes off, uh, goes in the city, didn't even bother to collect her things that she was, I mean, she, she went to the well to get water, the pot was left, which means two things. She had a, she wanted to get out fast, but she's gonna come back. It says verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, water pot. <laughs> woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? There's a lot to unpack in these two short verses. Could it, you know, like I said, the, the awkwardness of the situation maybe spooked her a little bit. Sometimes there's just nothing to say, and and um, you know, this woman's work that day was putting to a holding pattern. You know, she had her work to do, but it's like, uh, it doesn't matter. Leave my water pot there with a bunch of strangers. No problem. I got something to do. Uh, and the, the, the detail about the water pot being there, to me, speaks of the authenticity of this account. And we've spoken several times about things in the story that if it was a fictional story or a fairy tale, that they wouldn't be there. They just don't fit for you know, for a fairy tale, <laughs> for a story. But uh, the fact the water pot was there would indicate that it was important to come back later. It indicates that to me, but it's never mentioned again. It's just simply a little detail that an eyewitness is giving that strikes the writer as interesting. And, and personally, I'm glad that John left that there because it tells us that the woman figured out the best thing to do would be to get more people to come listen to Jesus and to, come, and to bring them back herself even though she was not generally, seemed to not be generally accepted in that society. And um, the other thing is that it didn't, she didn't want to get slowed down. I mean, water pots are not like things, <laughs> especially if, they, if she's already drawn her water and she's gonna come back for it anyway. So she was gonna come back. So she was so excited and impressed by Jesus' kindness, I believe that, that she wasn't thinking about the criticism she might get by going and telling the men <laughs> about this, I mean, you know, she's got sins in her past. We know about those things. Um, but she actually used that as part of her testimony to those that knew her so well. Come, see a man that told me all these things I've done. <laughs> we know what you've done. <laughs> but some stranger's telling you this. What's going on? I think it's the Christ. So it's just... <laughs> She, she exaggerated a little bit, I'm sure. He didn't, you know, outline everything she'd done since she was a baby. But, you know, it, to her, it was everything that was hidden in her heart. Those things that she didn't want people to know or she wasn't proud of. Jesus had probably told her some other things, too, that were secret. Things that you were hidden away. She thought nobody else know, knew. But in Isaiah 11, verse 2, talking of the Messiah, it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. So they knew, she knew this had to be someone from God. You notice that she didn't feel condemned by what Jesus told her. Uh, you don't sense that, that he was judging her or she doesn't feel like that he hated her for her sins. But even as he was reading her very inward thoughts of her heart, uh, that wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding that Isaiah spoke about, that and that he was bringing her good news, that he was lovingly wanting to teach her the right and proper way to live that it would fulfill her life. He wasn't there to bring her down, he was there to help her. So while the Samaritans 
did not accept the majority of the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures, including Isaiah, they did, for some reason, anticipate the coming of the Messiah. They have even heard about John baptizing and that he was proclaiming that the, the Messiah was coming. And so <clears throat> they did understand a lot of the things that uh, folks like Isaiah wrote in the scriptures. And, um, you know, it really tells me that it doesn't matter when you're sharing the gospel, that if the person that you're sharing the gospel with doesn't believe the scriptures, okay, they're still true. And God still does speak through them. So our life lesson here is the best way to reach someone who doesn't believe the Bible is to let them hear the Bible and God's word more and more. The best way to reach someone who doesn't believe the Bible is to let them hear the Bible and God's word more and more. Romans 10 verses 14 and 17 say, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So that's exactly how to turn somebody from no faith, from no belief in God or the Bible, to someone full of faith, someone preaching and someone hearing the word. That's how you turn someone from darkness to light, uh, from condemnation to everlasting life. And, and uh, please uh, don't get hung up on the word preaching in that translation, okay? Um, you think, oh, I'm not a preacher. Uh, verse 14 in the New Living makes it even more clear. How can they believe? I mean, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells him or tells them? So it's just, you know, in this context, a preacher is just someone who tells them God's word. So be that someone that tells them. <laughs> Several years ago, I was on a college campus in Nigeria. I was giving out copies of God's Word to the students and, and one of them had a question about it. So I just opened up the scripture and started to read to them, share with them some of the good news that was found there, just reading the scriptures to them. Uh, now, all around us going by, um, you know, there were other men that were, were giving the scriptures out as well. There were, there were thousands of students. And uh, as I shared the words of the Bible, you know, telling how you can confess Jesus and believe the death, burial, res resurrection of Christ and, and putting your faith in him to save you. Uh, There's one of the students that, that called out to me, hey, preacher, hey, preacher. And he started to ask a question. <laughs> you know, my first reaction was, I'm not a preacher. You know, I'm a video guy. <laughs> that, that was my, my thought. And then I realized that's all a preacher is. It's just someone who is follower of Jesus that's sharing God's word with somebody else. So, okay, maybe, maybe that's okay to say that. Um, I just kind of feel more like one of my friends said, uh, I'm just a beggar telling other beggars where to find the bread at. So, uh, but we want to share that. And, and our life lesson here is the turning point that changes someone's life will be when you open your mouth and tell them the words of God. The turning point that changes someone's life will be when you open your mouth and tell them the words of God. And please also know that while it's good, and while I'm teaching, I'll give you the references to the scriptures. It's good to know where these passages are found so you can verify. Um, it's not necessary to quote the reference when you're sharing it with somebody else. Somebody said, well, I know the Bible says this, but I don't know where it's at, so I can't tell them that. Yes, you can. No, just tell them, you know, God loves you so much, he sent his own son, Jesus so that you can have everlasting life when you believe in him. Yeah, even if it's not exactly right, God will use his words in their, their hearts. Um, many times you'll find yourself sharing and not even repeating the phrase the Bible says. It's good that people know it comes from the Bible, but sometimes just saying the words, saying God's word, you know, it's not the references, you know, God doesn't say the references to my word will not come back to me void. <laughs> he says my word will not return to me void. So. You know, use his words. If you need the references, great. You can dig in, find more scriptures. You can, you know, look at the context. That's, that's wonderful. But God's word is powerful without anything else added to it. Without me even saying another word. If I just stood here and told you the words of God. I, I, the, the most blessed time in this teaching is probably the first few minutes when I was actually reading God's word to you. So hopefully, uh, you know, he's speaking to you now.
So back to our text, the woman was putting herself on the line here. She's likely telling every man she came in contact with that there is a man out by Jacob's well that spoke to her with supernatural wisdom and knowledge and it was sending shock waves through the town as she said, could this be the Christ? So think about it. Samaritans were literally the outcasts of Israel. It's a large region in Israel too. It's, it's amazing how when you look at it, how much area they covered. But they've been dispersed, just like uh, others had been uh, years earlier, but they were pretty much people that mixed with the other nations. They came back into the area of Israel, the land of, you know, God's land there, and they were pretty much treated like garbage. Is that a nice way to say it? Um, you know, when you, when, you, <laughs> when you walk all the way around, when you spend an extra half a day or a day on a journey just to avoid walking through a town, you pretty much are, are not trying to build good relationships with them. So we read over in, in, back in Isaiah again, chapter 11, verse 12, in the part of the scriptures that Samaritans didn't even read or didn't believe, supposedly, it spoke of Jesus as the Messiah and what he would be doing when he comes. It said, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. We see that right here, coming to life in the scriptures, it's fulfilled. This woman was so bad, she was an outcast of the outcast, but something in her testimony touched the town, touched their hearts, just asking the obvious, could this be the Christ? And we see in verse 30, then they went out of the city and came to him. So, um, those outcasts. I'm not sure if it was her testimony that was so powerful or, or that the men of Sychar was just, just happened to be very receptive. Really doesn't matter, but it's always good to see when people respond to our testimony about Jesus. Um, I was reminded of Mary Magdalene um, and the other ladies at the, after the resurrection, they saw the tomb was empty. You know, the angel talked to them. Hey, you know, there's, <laughs> Jesus is risen. And they rushed back. They were told, go tell his other disciples. Mark 10, uh, Mark 16, 10 to 11 said, she went and told those who had been with him and they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. It's a woman's testimony. Sorry, ladies. I mean, that's just the way it was back in that time. Um, I think nowadays we probably believe a woman more than we do men, but <laughs> things change. Luke 24, 11, in another account, and their words seemed to them like idle tales and they did not believe them. So this is how women's testimonies were being treated at that time. Yet this town was coming out to Jesus. In the case of the resurrection, the ladies said they'd even been a part of a close group that had been with Jesus for years. And yet their fellow believers there didn't even believe them. So um, anyway, these men were stirred up. They wanted to see what was going on and her testimony was effective. Our life lesson here is you never know the effect of your testimony, but it will always direct people towards Jesus. You never know the effect, and I could say you never know the full effect of your testimony, but it will always direct people to Jesus. So again, let's get back to the well where Jesus had been resting and met the woman. She left to go into the town and verse 31 says, in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know, of which you do not know. Therefore, his disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Now, Jesus' disciples knew how worn out he was not to follow them into the city where they left him at Jacob's well and, and they were concerned. Um, Charles Spurgeon said, it's right for the spiritual man to forget his hunger, but it's equally right for his true friends to remind him that he ought to eat for health's sake. I think the disciples did well. So no criticism there of the disciples, but the short exchange actually revealed the secret of Jesus' strength. And this is that the spiritual was of utmost importance, even beyond what we consider fleshly needs. And it also revealed a little weakness in the disciples that they had not yet discovered. So. Another interesting thing is here is uh, this is the first time recorded in the gospel where Jesus' disciples called him rabbi, which also translates as master or teacher in varying passages. Um, it's a title of great respect and honor, um, means my great one and my honorable sir. 
So it's kind of a possessive. So if you're speaking of my rabbi, um, you know, it's, a, it's personal. You're following this person. So I think it's very, very interesting that the, they're calling him this now. And I notice that Jesus accepts this without exception. Uh, just as he was called rabbi by earlier by John's disciples and by Nathan, uh, Nathaniel and Nicodemus that we've studied out, each of them called him rabbi. And the reason I note this, I, I bring this up because later in the ministry, he reveals his feelings about how we should reserve such a personal title of honor for divinity. In Matthew 23, 8 to 10, he was publicly calling out the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. They loved to walk around the cities and be called rabbi, rabbi, you know. <laughs> they just loved to get that honor. And in front of all the crowds, Jesus told everyone, but you do not be called rabbi. For one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. So without, I, I could chase some more rabbits down another trail. I'll simply leave it there um, about calling people father <laughs> and other titles that uh, Jesus is not fond of people using for other than divinity. But let's see how, I mean, the other thing is, I'm, the, the point is that Jesus did not disclaim this title of divinity, but emphasized that this should be, this title should be only given to the Messiah, your Father in heaven, divinity. So let's see how Jesus responds when they insist that he eat. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white to harvest. And he who reaps receives wages, receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. Verse 38, I send you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Um, a few years ago, I was, I was a table host for a Christian informational meetings, and we invited guests to, for dinner, followed by a formal presentation by the moderator. And to respect the limited time, we told the guests how long they would be there, but there was much more information we had to go over uh, at the, you know, at, at the, with, with them to get to the information to them. And so while, the first, while our guests were served dinner, we as table hosts actually had a little flip chart with information on it, and we went over that and, and talked and gave information and, and chatted with the, the guests uh, while they were eating. And uh, I had one of the moderators that would, would tell the guests, said, uh, said that, you know, these, these men love this ministry so much they'd rather talk about it than even eat. <laughs> and, you know, I guess it's true. I guess it's true because I would, I would have much rather been able to help communicate um, to, to the, those folks and in that group it was really much more important for me to help those people learn about the ministry than lose time sitting there feeding my face um, when they turned and you know listened to the rest of the meeting uh, then I then I did feed my face really good so <laughs> but I, I you know the spiritual is more important than the physical and Jesus wasn't saying that food and drink weren't important uh, he wanted to know his, but he wanted his disciples to know that life was really more than these things. And, and that's really where he got his strength from doing the work that his father sent him to do. Just as much as the food that you eat uh, gave him strength. And you know, this is backwards. You know, it's a Christian life. Sometimes we, we seem backwards. You ever get called backwards? <laughs> um, we, yeah, we are backwards because the world doesn't think like that. First, feed our flesh. Then we can think about maybe some other things. But Jesus is saying the opposites here. We get fed. We feed our spiritual uh, work in our lives. We, we feed that and the rest of it will take care of itself. Uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And people look for the will of God in their lives. And what does Jesus say right here? The will of God is finishing his work. That he sent you for so our life lesson we get another life lesson got a lot of them this time we gain strength by doing and finishing 
the work that our Lord sends us to do. We gain strength by doing and finishing the work that our Lord sends us to do. Now at this point, Jesus knows what's happening, so he really doesn't even have time for, kind of like we did in that meeting, he didn't have time to eat food for the body, but immediately turns to the work of the disciples. And this is work that they don't even know that they're getting ready to do, <laughs> which is interesting, you know, but, he, but Jesus does, and that work is harvesting souls. Now, this is the first and only time that we read in the Gospel of John uh, of Jesus talking about the harvest. But there are other instances. There's a lot in Matthew and Mark and Luke where he speaks of harvest. So guess what you guys get this time? You know what I always do somewhere in the lesson? This is your homework, okay? Google, not Google, but go into your Bible app or you know, look in your concordance and look for the word harvest and study out these times in the New Testament especially. And there are actually a few. Uh, in, in the Gospels, there's a lot. Um, but there's also some in the Old Testament that actually refer to the harvest in the New Testament. So uh, do that. That'll, that way I won't have to take another 20 minutes here <laughs> of your time and do that and you'll get some enrichment. So in our text today, Jesus is introducing that concept of harvest to his disciples and we'll, as we'll see just in time. Um, we're going to see what happens. Verse 35 says, Do you not say there are still four months, then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. I have no idea what that means. When you read that, do you, does that make sense to you? Any of y'all farmer, wheat farmers here? Does that? Uh, he, he's, he's, oh, there's something about that. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm just stupid, you know. I, I've never had video camera recording of field turning white. <laughs> but it's likely that many of Jesus' disciples here were farmers, and we know they were fishermen. They were experienced. They knew by the calendar, and they knew by the weather, and they knew by the, by the crops, how they were growing, how far away harvest time was. And when it got really close, they would look at their fields to determine just the right time to bring in the crops. Now, when a wheat field is ready to be collected, the tips of the plant appear to be white. And they've got a light tan body, but the sun's shining on them. It just looks like white and, you know, kind of moving around a little bit in the, in the breeze. And in contrast to the, the unripened green color, you know, it's dark green to light green before they're ready for harvest. Well, Jesus was teaching his disciples and, and us that we need to help develop the ability to recognize the right time for a spiritual harvest as well. So on this day, now picture where he was at. This day, he knew the Samaritan woman was bringing back many people from the town. It would make sense that, you know, as Jesus was here, his disciples had just come from town. Their backs were to the town. He was looking there. And what Jesus could see, but they couldn't, was a crowd of people in the distance coming their way. Okay, I googled the images of Samarit, uh, the Samaritans, and yes, there are Samaritans. Uh, I had earlier said there were about 800, I think uh, that was a few years ago. That actually increased, there's about 1,500 Samaritans now in that region of Israel. And guess what? Almost all of these pictures had the Samaritans with white skull caps. And some of them had some, some red decorating, some of them had other clothes, but many of them were in, in all white. These people were, had white tops. <laughs> So he's seeing this crowd that looks like a wheat field that's ready for harvest. And he says, look, behold, right? Means look, look, the fields are white to harvest. Turn around, see what's coming. And so he only had a few moments to, to continue to teach them what was going to happen. He painted that picture of the wheat harvest and wants to tell them. So our life lesson here is that when you hear Jesus saying things that don't make sense to you, Remember that he sees what's coming your way. When you hear Jesus saying things that don't make sense to you, remember that he sees what's coming your way. At this point, we know the crowd's coming. We know, uh, because we already read ahead, we cheated, we looked ahead. We know that the, the, they will reap a har harvest of souls for Jesus that they had not sown seeds into. And Jesus wanted to prepare them and tell them how it was all going to happen. And so in verses 36 to 38, he says, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, 
that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. So by now the disciples realized that Jesus had revealed himself to the woman at the well as the Messiah, that she'd gone to the town, told everybody to come see the Messiah. Um, so in this passage, who had been sowing seeds to bring people to Jesus? Jesus had, yes. And the Samaritan woman, obviously, was sowing some big seeds at that moment. Uh, possibility, they may have heard about the Messiah through the grapevine. When John the baptizer was in that area, he was just to the east of that area baptizing just um, you know, a little while earlier. Now, who will be the joyful and who will be joyful and receive the benefits and wages of that? Those who harvest the crops. In this case, the disciples will be doing a lot of the reaping as Jesus will be continuing to reveal himself, teaching them the things of God. The disciples didn't labor to prepare the ground, they didn't plant the seeds. They didn't water them, they didn't weed them, but now the harvest was coming to them. And notice, both the sower and reaper, they rejoiced together. And Jesus had to prepare them for this, because remember, just a few minutes earlier, they were amazed that he wasn't even talking to a Samaritan and a woman. She had two strikes against her already in the disciples' eyes, and they're like, what's going on? And now, Jesus is letting them know, you will all be rejoicing together. You're all in this together. Wow. Sometimes we need to remember that here in 2021, that we are, uh, we are all in God's work together. Uh, sometimes sometimes we, we get a little um, com competitive with people in other ministries, maybe, that, uh, you know, so sometimes, sometimes God uses ministries that we don't even agree with, maybe even that aren't even totally biblical, but that kind of plants a seed in someone's heart. Um, I met a man, uh, when, again, I'm going to jump back to Nigeria. I met a man in Nigeria, could not wait to tell me his testimony. He had been converted from being a Muslim to being in Christianity by Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and we know that they, are, they don't really, anyway, I won't go into that. But um, as he looked, as he compared the scriptures, as he read scriptures, and as he, he followed their teachings and asked questions that weren't being answered, he said, you know, I want to find out, I want, I want to find out how to really follow God. I don't want to be hypo, you know, hip, hypocritical. I want to follow what God really says. And uh, <laughs> it was funny because he, he said, one day I was, I was going through the town and I saw a sign that said, full gospel church. He said, that's what I want. I want the whole gospel. <laughs> so at least, you know, you went to a Bible believing church and, and uh, began to learn how to follow the Lord. It was kind of, kind of interesting, but uh, we do want to the best we can, we want to teach people right to start with. But I don't mind if someone brings someone to, to, you know, to, to Jesus and then I have to come back and help them learn more. That's what we're supposed to do. Go into all the nations you know, and teach them to observe all the things I've commanded you. I'm fine with that. So uh, you know, the main, main thing here is go ahead and do something. I really like how Ecclesiastes 11, 4, and 5 says, He who observes the winds, here we're talking about looking at the conditions, uh, in the Amplified, it says, He who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. And as you know, not what, and as you know not what is the way of the wind or how the spirit comes to the bones of a womb, in the wombs of a pregnant woman, as you know not what is the way of the wind or how the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a pregnant woman, even so, you do not know the work of God who does all. So as much as we think we know how to do some of the work of the Lord, and as much as we think we know how to gauge the seasons, and well, we can predict what happens, it's only God who really does that. So, you know, he's saying just, just do it, you know, <laughs> to borrow a Nike's uh, th term there. But do you think those who were with Jesus would have observed the wind, so to speak, waited for all the conditions to be favorable to share this good news with the Samaritans that day? No. I'd imagine in their mindset and in their traditions, um, we'd probably still be waiting for them to share the good news with the Samaritans. Um, I mean, and seeing that there's still 
over a thousand Samaritans still in that area today, someone needs to share the good news with them. But the Spirit of God knew the right time, it knew the right person to start sharing with, it knew the right place for this to happen at, revealed all this to Jesus. And even though he was hungry and thirsty and sat down, didn't even have a pot to bring water out of the well with, the Spirit of God fed him, gave him the strength to plant the seeds, to prepare the disciples, and to be ready for a great harvest for the kingdom. I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, there's, there's many, here's a life lesson. There are many things involved, and I see you writing, so I'll go slow. There are many things involved in bringing others to Jesus. Let him use you as he sees fit, whether sowing, watering, or reaping. We all rejoice when souls are saved. I'll give it to you later. It's long. There are many involved in bringing others to Jesus. Let him use you as he sees fit, whether sowing, watering, or reaping. We all rejoice when souls are saved. And uh, brothers and sisters, there's so much in the scriptures um, to, for us to learn. Uh, again, I, <laughs> I'm going to save the rest of this passage. I thought I'd get through it, but we'll save it for next time. Uh, jump in there. We're going to see... Uh, how so many people come to Jesus in the next part of the passage. We'll explore how um, your, their belief deepens. We talked before about different levels of belief. We're going to see some more about that. Uh, we'll probably see how miraculous signs play a role in preparing people for the kingdom of God. And uh, today, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Hope I've opened your mind to some of the possibilities uh, to explore in your walk with the Lord. I also pray your hearts have been stirred up to continue to prepare the way of the Lord for people to sow the seeds of the gospel into people's lives and, and um, water those seeds. And, and also don't forget to reap the harvest of those seeds today. Remember, God does his work in his way, whether or not uh, we know what's going on. I enjoy being a part of it when it happens. It's, and I know it's God because it's, I know it's not me. I pray that each one of us will be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit as, as he guides us each step of the way here. I hope you've each put your trust in him and uh, that, in, that trust is increasing as you draw closer to him day by day and ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit each day. Uh, why every day? Because we leak. <laughs> Hopefully we are spreading uh, the, the joy, spreading the, the Spirit of God to others as well. But he will give you that power to do his work every day. At this time I want to ask a blessing the Lord to bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.